I have drunk so much beer at this desk recently. So hey everybody, it's Aiden here once again, and well, back on the channel. So what I thought I'd do with a sort of return to YouTube is look at some things that happen around the world of Formula One, because there's always a conspiracy these days, and in sports they're becoming way more prevalent, such as FIA, MG, Mercedes, Live, live, live VAR pool. Almost got that out in one go. Uh, stuff of, of that ilk. So what I thought I'd do is to get some momentum going on the channel is I thought I'd press the issue on some myths and conspiracies that for whatever reason people still believe. So I thought I'd get things going with the 1994 Benetton and its rumoured traction control. So the story here is that after being punted out of the 1994 Pacific Grand Prix at Aida, Etten Senna stood at the side of the track and watched Michael Schumacher's Benetton just go round and round and round and round, listening for any telltale signs of traction control. because. Senna was convinced that there was something iffy about the car, whether it was running some sort of illegal aid that had been banned at the end of the 1993 season, or some other bits and pieces like that. Then after the race at Imola, which sadly took his life, McLaren, Benetton and Ferrari were ordered by the FIA to hand over their onboard computers, which were then sort of taken apart by Chyla Whiting and his friends at the FIA. So Ferrari complied immediately, but Benetton and McLaren took a lot longer to do so. Now, McLaren were found to have this automatic gear shifting system that was automatic on the upshift, but the driver controlled it on the downshift, so it was exploiting a little bit of a grey area in the rules. So McLaren effectively got away with it. But Benetton, well, they were found to have something which is now known as Option 13, which is also the name of my TCUK touring car team, which is a you know, cheeky plug. But when the FIA asked about it, Benetton showed them how it worked. They could either plug in a laptop and do it that way at the start of a race, or the driver could effectively enter a cheat code on the steering wheel. So it's what? A, B, B, X, Y, start, select? Is that it? And what this then allowed is for Schumacher, Verstappen, Herbert, whoever was driving the car, it meant they would get a perfect start every time. So what they effectively had was, well, what they did have was launch control, not traction control per se. People say, oh, Senna was right, Senna was right. Well, they had an illegal driver aid, just not the one he thought that it was. Moving on into number two, we have the 1600 horsepower BMW engine from the 1980s. Now this was, 1600 horsepower in qualifying trim because there is absolutely no way that the engine with that much power and turbo boost would have survived more than two laps. And there's a reason I call that Brabham the world's fastest hand grenade because if it ever did more than two full tilt qualifying laps, it would blow up because it was having four bar of pressure shoved through it. And they, well, I mean, they were designed to do so, but not for that long. And this was back in the days when teams had gearboxes, engines, and FI issued tires just for qualifying and then they just ran detuned engines and gearboxes to, to, to last the, the race. Now I went on an internet and looked this up and on Reddit there was this user called Cloic, Cloic, I don't know how to pronounce it, but he said that it seems that every year people add another 100 horsepower onto it so they can do the back in my day argument and you know win said argument. But it was a 1.6 litre turbocharged inline four with more power in qualifying than any V12 or V10 ever had. Maybe we should be lobbying to bring those back instead. Now, Automotor und Sport, which is a German publication, you can probably tell by the name, it's going to turn out to be Swiss, isn't it? Or Austrian. Automotor und Sport puts the actual amount of horses up to around 1430 horsepower at 5.1 bar of boost, which is around 74 psi for you Americans. Now, moving on to number three, my favourite, Timo Glock let Lewis Hamilton pass for the 2008 Brazilian Grand Prix. There's onboard footage on YouTube. You can watch that whole last lap from his 
T-cam above his head. That car was impossible to drive in the wet. And that's how Formula 1 tyres work. You have them built for wet weather, damp weather and wet weather. Road car tyres, they work in almost all weather because they're designed to. They push water out the way, they have grip on slippery surfaces and things like that. They, they'll do 12,000 miles if you drive like a civilised human being. Formula 1 tyres will barely last 300 miles. In case you weren't there, the 2008 Brazilian Grand Prix, Lewis Hamilton won the title on the last corner of the last lap of the last race of the season, gaining the fifth position he needed to snatch the title away from Felipe Massa, who won the race. And you know, if Felipe won, uh, uh, Lewis had to be a fifth or higher to, to do so, and he, he won the title by a single point as a result. Now, there were conspiracies left, right and centre, and still are, that Glock took a dive to let his mate through, or was paid by McLaren, depending on which Twitter feed or uh, Facebook comment thread you read, and was gifted the championship on his way to becoming now the winningest driver of all time. Except, they weren't really mates. Hamilton was friends with Sutil, rather than Glock, and at Monza that year, Hamilton had squeezed Glock wide at the first chicane at Monza, I think it was on the entrance to the first chicane at Monza, and Glock was a little bit miffed by that. And he said, I'm not going to let that happen again, so he had no reason to let Lewis through. But, you know, I think it's just salt that feeds that one. But, come on, he was on slick tyres, groove tyres as they were back then, and it was pissing down. Him and Trulli were still out there on the slicks, and even if Glock had pitted, and this is the most important part, if Glock had pitted, he'd have still finished behind Hamilton. And not only that, he and Trulli were something around 22 seconds slower than the rest of the field on that final lap, and were less than a tenth from each other's lap on the lap Lewis and Vettel passed him. So I don't know how people can seriously suggest that Toyota choreographed it to be that close. But, needless to say, Glock has made sure he can never return to Brazil again. Once because he denied a Brazilian the first title since 1991, and the other reason being he had the number 17 car in DTM. Why is that an issue? Well, what he did was he took the number 17 and he added a Brazilian flag next to the 1 and a German flag next to the 7, in reference to the spanking that Germany gave Brazil in the 2014 World Cup. Number 4. Returning to V10s and refuelling will solve the lack of racing. Yeah, because the engines are linked to the aerodynamics, aren't they? Come on. The thing is, with the fueling, is that it makes the car heavier the more you add. So if a car is going longer into the race, it's going to be heavier and will be slower than the car that's got less fuel in it. So the car that's got less fuel in will be able to pull away than the car that's heavier. You won't be able to catch up and you won't have any racing. Then everything just happens in the pit lane and then you'll be complaining that there's no overtaking again. Just strip off some aero and sod the lap times. Number five, and you've probably heard this one a million times this year, he's only won because he had the fastest car. Well, yeah. Nobody won in an Andrea Moda. And number six, pole position on the dirty side in 1990 because Balestri. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. Formula 1 first went to Suzuka in 1987. Gerhard Berger took pole position in that race. It was on the dirty side then, and in 88, and in 89, and in 1990. So the TLDR of this whole thing is, it was always there. So any Balestri moved it to screw Senna arguments are totally baseless because it was always there. And all of that, plus the feeling that he'd been screwed out of the title the previous year, led to the now, you you, know, you no longer go for gap that exists line that is used all over the world by sim racers, firing into corners with no chance of making the move stick. But you know, it's it's been 30 years now. I'm 30. I'm old. So there we go, six myths F1 fans around the world still, for whatever reason, still believe. Are there any others out there that get thrown around that need debunking, or have you learned something new by me debunking these myths? Or just facts? I'm back, sort of. No idea how I'll keep these sorts of videos going, but you know, I'm going to try and find a way. 
It is nice to be back. Uh, so thanks to the people that have stuck around all this time. And also massive thanks as always to the patrons that have continued their support in the sort of month and a bit that I've been gone to try and work out what it is I'm doing. But as always, everything you need to know to keep up with my ramblings on social media and all that good stuff is in the description box for you. And I guess the other question that's going to come is the shirt. I got drunk and nine pounds plus PNP later. Career over. So thanks a lot for watching. I've been Aidan Moord. Have a great day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again hopefully soon for another video. So until then, goodbye.